Westworld Season 2 Episode 5 begins in the week ahead timeline. Strand's forces are draining the flooded valley and fishing out the dead hosts, bringing them to the Mesa Hub to try and fix them and recover their code. But Antoine finds that a third of the host brains are empty. Not like they're wiped, but like they never held data to begin with. So did someone put new empty brains in these hosts? What happened to their old brains? Maybe these empty hosts are decoys, and Dolores put their real brains in new bodies so that they can escape Westworld, like how Maeve got a new body to remove the explosive in her spine last season. Dolores said she'd use the valley as a weapon, so maybe these hosts in the valley are part of her plan. We also see more of the Cradle, a kind of simulation technology, or time capsule. Someone has destroyed the host's backups it held. If the hosts no longer have backups, maybe it's now possible for them to permanently die. And like William, the robots are in real danger for the first time. Strand makes a weird comment about someone giving quite a story. He might mean Ford's story. At least some of what's happening this season seems to be part of Ford's last narrative. He said there'd be violence and surprises and the birth of a new people. Both Bernard and William say that they're in Ford's game. But Strand looks at Bernard and talks about figuring out how the story turns. Like in episode 1, it seems like Strand is trying to get information out of Bernard. What does he think Bernard knows? Something about Peter Abernathy or James Delos or Ford and the general Skynet shitstorm? Does Strand know that Bernard is a host? Bernie is acting weird. There are theories that this Bernard is actually a human host clone of Arnold, or that this whole week ahead timeline is a simulation in the cradle to interrogate Bernard. At this point, we still don't know, but something is up here. In the previous week timeline, Teddy and Dolores arrive at Sweetwater. Teddy calls this place home because he and Dolores lived here for 30 years, but Dolores says it's not really home. They see Clementine meeting the new host that took over her role after Clem was decommissioned. She says the same scripted lines that Clem said in her loop. So this is proof of the fakeness of life in Sweetwater, and if their lives were fake, is Dolores and Teddy's relationship real? They go to a field where they used to dream of running away together someday, but after 30 years in their loops, someday never came. Now that they're free, Teddy asks Dolores to finally go start a life together, but Dolores feels she has to stay and fight her war against humans. In a way, her wokeness makes her less free. She feels more responsibility now than she did as an ignorant machine. But Dolores does decide that her love for Teddy is real, and they have sex, maybe for the first time in their 30-year relationship, but it might also be their last time. Dolores has a weird metaphor about burning weak cows to stop a spreading sickness. The point is, she thinks Teddy is too nice to survive the war ahead. Like, in episode 3, Teddy let Craddock go free, then Craddock went on a killing spree in Las Mudas. Teddy's mercy is dangerous, and with this sickness metaphor, it sounds like Dolores is worried that Teddy's compassion might spread. So Dolores uses her human tech, Phil, to overwrite Teddy's personality. The changes are so extreme that Phil says Teddy might not survive. These shots from a pre-release of the episode show Teddy's personality before and after. Dolores maxes out his aggression and cruelty and sets his empathy to zero. Those shots might not be canon, but the point is that Dolores destroys the man Teddy was. She sacrifices the one she loves for the sake of her war like Stannis with Shireen. As Maeve argued earlier, it seems hypocritical for Dolores to kill and control people when she claims to be fighting for freedom. Dolores says that this is the only way, and that she knows how this story ends. So maybe she's got some master plan with the valley and these hosts and the death of Teddy, but even if this wins her war, is it worth her becoming just like the enemy she's fighting against? Dolores prepares the Westworld train to go to the Mesa Hub and rescue her host father Peter, who was taken by Charlotte in episode 3. After Dolores' brutality towards Teddy, you gotta wonder if Dolores is helping Peter out of love, or if she just needs the data in his head for her plan. Maeve and co get captured by samurai hosts from Shogun World. Maeve uses her voice commands on them, but they don't work, because the Shogun hosts only know Japanese. That would explain why these Ghost Nation hosts were immune earlier. They speak Lakota. 
But Lee says that all hosts have many languages buried in their code, which will probably come in handy later. Lee says Shogun World is like Westworld, but more violent and Japanese, so rich weebs can wave katanas around, which doesn't seem very safe. Westworld's guns are one thing, but it must be hard to stop guests hurting themselves with swords and things. We learned that Lee copied bits of Shogun World off Westworld, so there's a town like Sweetwater, with a place just like the Mariposa Saloon. The hosts Akane and Sakura are based on Maeve and Clementine, and the hosts Musashi and Hanayo rob Akane's tea house, just like Hector and Armistice robbed Maeve's saloon. Lots of these shots are direct recreations of the Westworld originals. So this is a classic Westworld brainfuck, using repetition to make us question identity. What does it mean to be Maeve when there's a Japanese copy of her? It also reflects the long history of Japanese samurai films and westerns borrowing from each other. Musashi's actor says it's beautiful the way East and West used each other's ideas, and yet HBO keeps restricting our videos for copyright, so go figure. The Westworld hosts have mixed reactions to their doppelbots. Hector doesn't trust Musashi, Armistice and Hanayo snake charm each other, and Maeve sees herself in Akane. Akane's motherly relationship with Sakura is similar to Maeve's relationships with Clementine and with her daughter. So when Akane kills to protect Sakura from the Shogun's men, Maeve decides to help her. That night, the group is attacked by the Shogun's ninjas who abduct Sakura. Maeve has visions and hears voices. She seems to be tapping into the mesh network that Bernard mentioned, a subconscious link between nearby hosts. So it's like Maeve is psychic and can hack hosts with her mind. She uses this voice power to control and kill a ninja. When the Shogun's army arrives, Hector, Musashi, Armistice, and Hanayo make a distraction so Maeve and Akane can escape. Turns out Maeve wasn't kidding about leaving Hector for dead. Lee questions whether Maeve should risk herself to help Akane and Sakura, arguing that they're just machines. But Maeve says that her choices and love are more than just code. On the way to save Sakura, we see Delos security have been slaughtered by Shogun World hosts, which is impressive. Like, the Battle of Fort Forlorn Hope was one thing, those hosts had guns and nitro, but the Shogun hosts have swords, and somehow they beat Delos security who have assault rifles. But they also have walkie-talkie thingies, Lee takes one from a corpse. Maybe he's planning to betray Maeve and rejoin the humans. Maeve and Ko pretend to be a Chinese envoy, and go meet the Shogun. The Shogun's off his loop, but not cause he's woke, he's just broken, leaking brain fluid like Bernard was. Akane shows herself to the Shogun, who is shocked that she'd risk her life for Sakura instead of running away. It's just like how Maeve risks her life to rescue her daughter instead of leaving Westworld last season. The Shogun agrees to release Sakura if Akane dances for him. That night, Maeve and Akane find the Shogun has carved the shape of a cherry blossom tree into Sakura's back. The name Sakura means cherry blossom in Japanese. Akane and Maeve talk about their shared scripted story of a new world, which represents freedom to them. Maeve uses her voice power and offers to wake Akane, show her the truth behind her simulated world. But Akane refuses, and Maeve respects her choice, so Akane can keep her grief for Sakura's pain. Which kind of implies that love and grief are illusions that Akane might lose if she awoke. But the way Maeve lets Akane choose contrasts with Dolores forcing Teddy to her will, though these both might be paths to consciousness. A big theme of last season is that suffering leads hosts to awakening. Dolores makes Teddy suffer, and says we all need to suffer to grow, and Maeve lets Akane choose to feel Sakura's pain. These two different paths to consciousness might reflect how Maeve and Dolores themselves first became conscious. Maeve chose to get off that train, but Dolores' awakening with Ford was suspiciously similar to the coded killing of Arnold. Is Dolores really free? The stage is set for Akane's dance. In the background, these banners show symbols of Westworld, the maze, and the Delos data project, because the best way to hide a conspiracy is to show its symbol everywhere. The Shogun kills Sakura, to the horror of Akane and Maeve. Of course, they could probably resurrect Sakura, like Dolores raised Craddock, but maybe Sakura's death is more meaningful if it's final. In episode 1, Arnold said that something's real when it's irreplaceable. Akane performs her dance, and ends it by ripping off the Shogun's head, kinda like in Zoolander. 
The title of this episode is Akane no Mai, which can mean Akane's dance. But Akane also means deep red, and this is a bloody red dance. Just before the Shogun's men kill Maeve, she unlocks her mutant power and reaches into the Matrix and makes all the Shogun's men kill each other. With her new power, Maeve can control all hosts. She says she found a new voice, and now we use it. And then she picks up a sword. But maybe Maeve will use her power for something more than killing. Before, we saw Maeve use her voice power to lead Akane towards consciousness. Maeve's power can wake hosts. And the way Bernard described the mesh network, a message can be sent to nearby hosts who spread the message to get more hosts. If Maeve's voice works through this network, maybe Maeve could chain wake hundreds of hosts at once. So Westworld continues to ask complex questions about freedom and control, consciousness and identity. Who, what, and when is Bernard? Is Ford still in control? What's happening at the Valley? Is it okay for Dolores to control hosts? Are Dolores and Teddy's lives real? What does it mean to be you if there are two yous? And what's the right way to use a magic Wi-Fi superpower? Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe, and consider supporting Old Shift X on Patreon. You can get behind the scenes stuff on the Discord, topic votes, scripts, streams, and more. Thanks to patrons Brett M. Benick, Mike Valdellon, Scott Seligman, Ashley Carter, Kajitan Janiak, Sable Lion, Kendra Henry, Anne Fisk, Rayan Jabani, and Honeycomb. Cheers.